Hello and welcome to the Buckets and Tea MBA show. I'm your host, Catherine Niker. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode. Today, I have one of the Raptors Republic's favorites. He's a freelance writer. He begged me not to give him an introduction, but I'm doing my best anyways. It's Oren Weisfeld. How you doing? Good. Shout out to the Raptors Republicans. Um, you know, that's, that's what I call them now. Yeah, that's, shout out to that's us. That's the following. Are we getting? Yeah, are yeah. we becoming more conservative by the day? Or every loss good? the Raptors have, the fan base just gets more and more conservative <laughs> and extreme. They just go in extremes, <laughs> both both ends of the spectrum. Like, oh, that's, that's what so I think funny. is happening. So, um, yeah. I, uh, on my WNBA pod, I, I was ranting about how every time I watch something NCAA, I feel like I'm participating in a conservative agenda. Yeah. <laughs> and, now, <laughs> and now I'm doing it here, too. Yeah. It's like, imagine if you watch, like, Saudi soccer with Cristiano Ronaldo, like, stuff like that. It's just like, even, not to get, this is really in the weeds, but even, like, now all these soccer teams are owned by, like, um uae like princes and it's like what am i supporting here what exactly every wow. time I, I actually i i didn't know that because i don't really follow soccer. yeah there's a lot of shady money in 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 sport but especially soccer anyways yeah. wild times raptors okay. republicans you know good fan base love them yeah well, you know it's a passionate fan base everyone cares a lot you know we've had a disappointing season you know, it, I, you know, we'll get into all the Raptors, you know, in the second half, we always do NBA first and then Raptors second on the show. But, uh, you know, it's been a long time since we've been below expectations, Tampa season aside, right? Mm. Like I was thinking that because even in the years we were rebuilding, it was like we were still growing and there's so much optimism in that. And this year, I feel like it's the first time in a long time as a Raptors fan base where we're on a decline we didn't see coming. And uh not sure what to do with that exactly. So uh, anyway, we'll get into all the feels of that. But I want to talk yeah. about the NBA and, and specifically, you know, the Western Conference playoff picture because it's one of the tightest playoff races we've ever seen, you know, four through 11 being very, very tight, just a few games apart. Uh, last night, we're recording this on Thursday, so this will come out Friday. So we're talking about Wednesday night. You know, the Lakers and the Clippers faced off. The Clippers had what I thought was a very solid win against the Lakers. They really kind of dominated the game throughout, controlled the game. Uh, no Paul George yet. Uh, Kawhi was in the game. Russ was in the game. He had a, you know, a Russ revenge game question mark against the Lakers. But I think, you know, one thing I wanted to ask you is like, you know, are the Clippers for real? Did they win the trade deadline by getting Russ? And, you know, in a four or five matchup, which looks like as of today would be against the Suns, do they have a chance? Yeah, I think the Clippers, in hindsight, made some shrewd moves at the deadline. Um, even beyond Russ, like Bones Highland has been playing good for mm -hmm. them. Um, Eric Gordon's been been starting and playing really good for them. Plumlee's been good for them. And then Russ, everyone thought Russ was going to be a, a complete disaster and ruin their locker room and everything. And yeah, he's been pretty good. Like, he's not he's definitely limited. He's not really closing a lot of games for them, but you know, Ty Lue has him in a role that makes sense for him. He's around shooters. That makes sense for him. And I, I didn't think it would work out this well. I didn't think it would like ruin the locker room. Like a lot of people anticipated, but I didn't think it would work out as well as it has been. So kudos to Russ. Cause I'm a Russ fan. I always have been. And it's nice to see him actually succeed, especially last night against the Lakers who gave up on him. But in terms of, like, did the Clippers win the deadline? I would say no, just because this is, like, the most all-in team in the league. And until they actually do something in the playoffs, like, even, like, get to a conference finals at least, like, until they do something like that, the Clippers are still a complete disappointment <laughs> every single, like, <laughs> like, they're, like, they went all in on Kawhi and Paul George. You have to actually prove it in the playoffs for anyone to give you respect. Well, they did make it to a conference finals once, didn't they? Yeah, they yeah. did in the bubble, yeah. In the bubble, and then... Was it in the bubble, or was it the year? No, it wasn't in the bubble. 
Um, they lost to the Nuggets. And then yeah. they were in a conference final, I believe, against the Phoenix Suns the year they were in the finals with Milwaukee. And then Milwaukee okay. won. I'm pretty sure. Okay, so the next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did make yeah. one conference finals. For yeah, sure. and then remember Kawhi was injured? Yeah, yeah. And then they had to compete in that without him. Uh, yeah. And then he was like weirdly like away from the team and then with the team and just being, I don't know, just being Kawhi essentially. But yeah. I still don't trust the Clippers. Like you saw the other day that Kawhi just like didn't play the second half of a game because they were on a back to back and none of the players knew about it. And Russ was like publicly like, no, we didn't know that was pretty weird. And so there's still weird <laughs> stuff like that load management going on. And then I watched the end of last game and it's just like, they have this 10 point lead, but they still are a complete mess in like crunch time. And like when it matters, like they can't, seem to get the ball into Kawhi Leonard's hands at times where they just like turn it over before even getting it into their best player's hands. And it's like, they should be able to run simple stuff in the clutch, get it to Kawhi, space out, screen for him, that kind of stuff. But again and again, they fail to do those simple things. And so I'm definitely not a Clippers believer. Yeah, I think that's really fair. And honestly, with a, with a 4-5 matchup against the Suns, they could easily be out in the first round. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, which would be a huge disappointment for this team who, like you said, is like the most all in team in the league. Uh, literally there's an arena being built for this team, uh, as we speak with, you know, the most toilets any arena has ever seen. Um, yeah. they really want you to know that real quick on that. I think <laughs> if Steve Ballmer really wanted to put his money where his mouth is two ply toilet paper. You know what I'm saying? Like you never go to an arena that has two ply toilet paper. <laughs> but that I think would really be like baller. That's true. You know, he's talked so much about the toilets, but no one's asked him about the quality of the toilet paper he plans to uh, supply. So I bet it's one ply. Honestly. We we need you. We need you to be in that media scrum to ask the real questions. Okay, someone fly me out to LA. Yeah, they should. Yeah. Look, there's a Raptors. There's a Kawhi Norm Powell angle. You know, there's a Charmin angle. There's a Charmin angle. Frankly, they should just sponsor the whole trip. And, yeah. you know, I feel like I actually feel like that's really legit. That's really funny. That would go very viral for a Charmin. Yeah. You know, a it would, but I, perhaps. I honestly feel like strongly about that. Um, I'm so <laughs> tired of this, you know, one ply toilet paper in all public <laughs> spaces. We're above that as a society. Like we need to like... <laughs> Ask these rich people for a little bit more than that because you paid three hundred dollars to go to a Raptors game. They're still giving you one ply. It's crazy. Yes. Uh, listen, I agree with you. I do think you spend more time in stadiums than most people, so yeah, you've had a lot of time to think about this. <laughs> Lots of time. Lots of time. Also, spent a lot of time just sitting around in stadiums aimlessly thinking. So. Yeah, like yeah. I've been to two games this year, so I haven't really put that kind of thought into it, but. I fully agree with you. I support you. I didn't know this is where this was going. But yeah, sorry. No, I love it. I love the tangents on this podcast. Uh, yeah. yeah, I really think you got to you gotta get in there. Or at least, yeah. No, I think you could get in there. I was going to say, or at least get some other media personnel that's there to do that questioning. But you deserve it. You deserve the moment. I do. And I'll be actually curious on a serious note to see if Steve Ballmer's genius toilet idea works, because my theory is more that people just linger at halftime because they want to drink and talk and do stupid stuff in the atrium. I don't think it's because they're all waiting in line for the toilet. You know what I mean? Yes. Like when you come back from a Raptors game in the third quarter and it's like empty. I from my experience, a lot of people are just hanging out in the in the atrium area. It's not like they're all so. I'll be curious to see if that actually makes a difference. We'll see. Yeah, I think so, too. Also, like, you can order food to your seat, which is something mm -hmm. I don't think enough people take advantage of. Mm -hmm. And But even then, it's like the food and drinks that you can order to your seat are limited. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted something, like, beyond, like, the popcorn or the basics, then you do have to get up to get it. So yeah. anyway i take advantage of it because i can't be bothered i'm you know i really like to uh be in my seat the whole time i also mm. really like a halftime show love a good halftime show halftime yep there's you some know? great halftime shows That's i don't like when people mail it in 
Um, but I got yeah. I was there with the woman. I did she go by Red Panda? The woman with you the were at that game. I was at the that Denver game. game. Yes, I was at the Denver game. So she was, was like a literally great halftime best. show. Yeah, oh, that's phenomenal. probably the best halftime show. So it was great. Sometimes on like Fridays, I've noticed the halftime show will just be the DJ playing songs and the camera on the DJ dancing. Mm. And I'm like, this is no. unacceptable. This no. is just unacceptable. People paid for this game. Yeah, for the amount of money that we pay for Raptors tickets, especially this season, which has been disappointing. Like, at yeah. least give us a better halftime show. I went to a game in Detroit. Um, this was a few years ago now, so it was still Palace of Auburn Hills. But they had a whole, like, Motown cover band that was yeah. actually, like, in the stands. Mm. And that was their halftime show. And the band was really good. Yeah, they need that. But that's good. Yeah, they do need that, but also like it made the whole experience really fun. Anyway, yeah. I love it. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I try to hold it until the end of the game. But <laughs> moving on, uh, let's talk a bit about the Phoenix Suns. Uh, they have won their last, I believe, six in a row. They have not lost a game with Kevin Durant in the lineup. Um, they currently sit, sorry, I have so many tabs open right now. Uh, they currently sit fourth. Like I said, uh, if the playoffs started today, they would be in that four or five matchup with the Clippers. Um, are you a believer in the Suns? Definitely a believer. I think I would pick the Nuggets to come out of the West right now, um, which I don't think is a common opinion. I think most people are taking the Suns. A lot of people point. are hopping off that bandwagon. For sure. And I, I haven't yet just because I really value continuity and I value guys who have played together for years and have been in those moments together. And the Suns will be a fascinating test case for that because everyone just says, well, I get it. But Kevin Durant is the most seamless plug and play superstar, which he is. But that doesn't mean that like there's no precedent for a guy like playing six games with his team and then playing in the playoffs and winning a chip or anything like that. So I think when push comes to shove uh, and the Suns are, I, I just don't think the Suns are going to have that same ability to, to run through four series as a team like the Nuggets will because they've been together. They've done it before. They've been to a conference championship before. Um, and yeah, but I, I do think the Suns are really good. I think if they play the Clippers in the first round, they'll beat them. I'm hoping, honestly, for a Suns-Warriors first round, which I think is still a possibility. Uh-huh. Because there's so many storylines there with the KD and Warrior stuff. Yeah, that would yeah. be great. And I think it would be a competitive series. Um, but yeah, I think I, I like the Suns a lot. I think they have a great team. I think next year they'll probably be the favorites to win it all. Just, you know, they're going to have an offseason to get any vet who wants to ring chase and like a mid-level exception guy and just like build out the roster a little bit more, more depth. But more importantly for me, more chemistry and continuity um so yeah my my pick for this year is the nuggets they're playing tonight those two teams on thursday so that'll be a big mm-hmm. game and uh how about you that's where i'm at yeah i feel like i'm a pretty big believer in the suns i so the thing is i don't want to see a warriors suns matchup only because i'm a warriors fan and okay. they are desperate for an easier path right now <laughs> Yeah. Which we all know you is the Kings. The, the Kings, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, no disrespect to the Kings, but we all know it's the Kings because it's disrespectful. It is disrespectful, but actually, it isn't because you typically need multiple years of playoff experience to really get over the hump. And they are technically the defending champs, although they haven't necessarily played like it this year. But in any case, uh, you're right. The storylines would be amazing. It would be a better. Well, I don't know if it lines up to be a second round matchup, but. Um, it would be better as a matchup, you know, deeper into the playoffs. But I mm-hmm. think with the Suns, you know, I feel like on one hand, you're absolutely right. He is probably the best, like, as we would say, like plug and play player. He could fit into any team, any rotation, any anything. He's one of the best ever, Kevin Durant. But I do think if the net or sorry, if the Suns go on to win it, then he's going to miss out on the whole reason he left the Warriors was that, you know, he wasn't getting the flowers that he wanted. It was the whole idea that he joined this team that was already great. And then he helped them get over the hump. You know, the Suns, when they were healthy were in the finals 
And now he joins this team and now he's going to get them over the hump to win a championship. And I feel like that narrative is going to become more difficult for him to escape. Now there's the whole debate, whether that narrative is even fair or not, you know, like we look back at 2016, we look back at the situation he was in with OKC and Westbrook and how, you know, it was the move that actually made the most sense for him to do, but he really wanted to build something with the nets to have something that he could claim. Like I built this team. I got this to where we needed to go. And then they win. Obviously they did it and it imploded, but I don't know. I just feel like this is going to have very interesting implications for Kevin Durant and his legacy. I don't know how you feel about it. No, it's, it's a fascinating question. Like you asked in the rundown, what, a, a chip would do for his legacy and it's kind of, it's hard to figure out for a number of reasons one in the most simplest of terms if he won a chip he would have three and and that's just a big deal like yes. he, he would be inching upon four which is what curry and, and lebron have and just like just at the end of the day i do think you look back on it and you go numbers like first before breaking each down into oh was he a mercenary who came and got them over the helmet it doesn't really sure. matter at the like 10 years from now, it's going to be how many chips did he win? So that's a big deal. The other thing for me that's hard to parse through is like if KD asked for a trade from Brooklyn, if he was the one who broke up the Brooklyn situation and wanted to go to the Suns, then I would say, oh, this chip is pretty meaningless. Like he had to do it with Brooklyn. But we all know that Kyrie completely ruined that situation. Basically, in my opinion, left KD helpless and like, I didn't blame KD at all for asking for that trade once they traded Kyrie because it's like, what am I doing here on Brooklyn with no super, like co-star? Yeah. So because he was kind of put in this situation where it totally made sense for him to ask out and, and to get traded, it's hard to blame him if he wins a ring with the Suns for not doing it like the quote-unquote right way like it would have been with the Nets because he got screwed with the Nets and it was no fault of his own. It was... I mean, he chose Kyrie, but other than that, it was no fault of his own. So that's a long way of saying, yeah, it'll it'll be interesting how people form it. Um, and it, it'll also depend on his play a lot, right? Like if he is by far the Suns' best player in, in a run to win, I think people will, will kind of give him the credit he deserves. But if it's like Booker and then KD is like a co-star kind of, then, yeah, they're going to say, okay, he just hopped on and, and kind of helped them win it. Yeah, I think, like, no matter whether he wins with the Suns or not, he really has one of the more interesting, intriguing, and different uh, paths of an NBA superstar than most um, mm -hmm. when you really look at it. I feel like I would read a book about his whole career. It's been a very interesting uh a very interesting ride but yeah i think i'm a big believer in the suns i agree with you that continuity matters and it absolutely does but this team just feels like the exception to that rule i don't know and then That's when you look at next year you know like chris paul isn't getting any younger and i feel like they're going to be desperate to find someone who can take over his role i mean there's no like replacing quote unquote chris paul but they're going to be desperate to find someone that takes over his role to some degree because I mean, how much longer is he really going to have? Like, he's 30, he's 38, no? He's going to be 39 this year? I don't know, but he's old. Um, <laughs> yeah, the Chris Paul, on, on like, a nerdier basketball side of it, like, when you just look at the names, of course, they should be the favorite to come out of the West. But, again, there's just something to me about the Nuggets. But with Chris Paul, I will say, if the Suns are going to go all the way, he has to be a little bit more aggressive. Because whenever I, I watch them, he's always deferring. And teams are basically, like, not leaving him open, but they're they're okay with him getting somewhat open shots when KD and Booker are on the floor. And he keeps passing those up and, and like, kind of resetting the, the offense. And I just, I think he will be, but he's going to have to have some games where he scores 25 points. Like, right. And, and he hasn't done that this season at all. He's just deferred. And yeah, once I see a more aggressive Chris Paul, then I'll I'll even believe them a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Um, let's move on to talk a little bit about this new CBA. So the NBA and the, you know, is has allegedly come to terms with a new CBA, although it hasn't been 
officially signed off on and there's some things in the works like a like a mid-season tournament which um i saw draymond green has already been uh, critical of because it lacks uh incentive for the players he went on a whole tangent about how it lacks uh financial or otherwise incentives for the players to care about this mid-season tournament and that it mainly benefits the league. Um, there's also things in terms of like percentage of profits that go towards players um, from other league revenue that are shifting. And so essentially how I read it and Orin, I'm going to defer to you to maybe describe in more detail, but how I read it is, is that essentially there's a larger pie in that there's more money, but that the players slice of that quote unquote pie stays the same so mm-hmm. they're not necessarily making more money even though there's more money coming into the league no i think they will be making more money but so will the owners everyone's just gonna be wait- making more oh money. i see okay yeah it's still i think it's a 51 49 revenue split right um let me see we can check yeah 51 49 revenue split still um but yeah there's there's going to be more money in that revenue split. Um, and yeah, so everyone will be making a bit more money. <laughs> I think I think the two biggest things that stood out for me are, are the in-season tournament and the stuff that Draymond also went on a rant on, which was like how they're basically penalizing teams who spend a lot of money. And they're making it harder for like dynasties and just like – the Warriors and the Clippers of the world to build out a roster by spending a ton of money. Um, Those two things I think will have actual big implications. The rest of it is just kind of nerd talk. That's very legit. And, uh, you know, the thing about the dynasties, because I was, I was thinking about this and, you know, when you really look at it, like historically, like dynasties have been good for the league. Right. Like when you think about, you know, like the early Boston years and then, you know, you had the Lakers, Boston rivalry, the Bulls, et cetera. Now with the Warriors, I I just feel like like personally, I do enjoy the league more when it's wide open. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, I think it's more exciting, but also like at the same time, I have enjoyed watching these dynasties over the years. Like I like I love the Warriors, you know, and I think a lot of people do. And it's weird to go away from something that's been working all these years. But at the same time, I wonder this is like me putting on a bit of a conspiracy hat on. I wonder if in large part that is due to gambling being a real thing now that if the league is more incentivized to keep things more wide open and less predictable because gambling has become more part of the sport. You sure right about that. That's a fascinating idea. I never thought Thank about you. that. Thank um, you. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Cause I'm going to write about how like you you follow the WNBA, you have a podcast there and basically there's these two super teams that formed in the off season, right? Yes. And that has been good for leagues, like you said, to have these super teams. Dynasty is slightly different, but same idea. Um, And I think where the WNBA is right now, it's going to be great for them to have these two super teams that everyone knows um, going into the season. Like, these are the teams to watch out for. Maybe the NBA, the gambling point could make sense. I kind of just thought about it as like they're at a place where they don't necessarily need that like they have the viewers already and to keep the viewers maybe locked in a little bit more, they want parody. I don't know. That's just how I thought about it. Like the NBA basically is no longer in a place where they need the super teams to push their product. That's Um, also very interesting. Yeah. Cause the WNBA, I believe they haven't had a repeat champion since like the LA sparks in like the early two thousands, like it's been a long time since they've had a repeat champion. They've had teams mm. win multiple championships, like, like the links had a bit of a run and other teams, but it like year after year, it's always been another team somehow. Um, kind of like the warriors more recently where like they won, then they didn't win. Then they won again. Um, so yeah, that is interesting that maybe they don't need that anymore, but At the same time, there's still always talk about like who is the face of the league, right? Like that, I feel like that's still a thing that people care about. And there's always this constant shift to like get over the the ratings hump with the, with the NFL, which I'll never understand because I don't watch football. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, 
yeah like I, I don't know i feel like maybe they don't need that but also there is this there's always a desire to have like who is that new face of the league i personally love it when there is more than one face of the league like i don't think it needs to just be lebron's league or just kobe's league or whatever like but i don't know but maybe that's just me because i'm a sicko fan okay yeah there's a lot to say there i'm a sicko fan too which is why <laughs> real quick tangent on the side is why I don't like the play in tournament. Cause I watch the NBA like all season, regardless, I don't need like a, a tacky thing to add on to it to make me more interested. Like I'm already into it anyways, in terms of face of the league stuff, that's all bull. It's whenever someone says they're looking for like a face of the league, it they just mean an American face of the league because there is a bunch Ooh. of like, it's true though. Look at the league, Luca, like Giannis Embiid. Jokic, these guys are the best players in the league. And they're they international, them, yeah. Yeah, they don't want to give them the branding stuff because they're not American. So whenever we hear face of the league talk, it just means we're looking for an American to take that mantle, which I think the NBA should get away from that kind of thinking, but whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, the parody thing is really interesting because it's true. I like parody and, and I love this season for that reason. Um, but at the same time, it's not like we're having a parity issue under the current CBA, right? Like the Clippers right. and the Warriors are spending a ton and they're not winning, at least this season. And even last season, the Warriors, like, in my opinion, got like a lot of stuff went right for them. They were not some super juggernaut team that like cleared the, the right. Like, no, a lot broke their way. They got healthy at the way. right time. Yeah, exactly. So I didn't think anything was really necessary to change the parody stuff. And I agree with Draymond. The biggest thing is like you're disincentivizing spending, which I think is the worst thing you can do just because on the other side of the ledger are, are you're giving advantages to teams that are cheap. And that's the worst thing. The, like we're fans of the Raptors who like are owned by Bell and Rogers, these like huge conglomerates that make billions of dollars and yet like they won't go into the luxury tax. And it's like, can I swear on here? It's like, yeah, God. you can. It's just like, fuck you. Like, why does a team have to be a contender for you to pay into a luxury tax when you make billions of dollars? I, I don't think we should like be conditioned to just agree with that. So these kind of rules are just helping out MLSE and, and stuff like that, like who, who aren't willing to go into the luxury tax anyways. Yeah, I'm with you. I, uh, I'm pretty over Toronto as a city in general. <laughs> Just because it's cold and expensive here. You know what I mean? It's just cold <laughs> and expensive. And, yeah. you know, when you travel, you realize like there's nothing here that you can't see anywhere else in the world. I don't know. It's a whole thing. But with the Raptors, yeah, like it is such an expensive team. We spend so much money to attend games, to support them. And, mm. you know, if we are this quote unquote, like, you know, not a free agency destination, then it's like when it makes sense to just go that extra mile, especially if the money does exist. And then therefore you generate more revenue because of it. Like there's no way I could be convinced that like the championship didn't add more money to mm -hmm. MLSE, right? Like mm -hmm. even like the tickets were more, the merch was more suddenly you're buying more merch than you ever did. Right. Like all that championship, like stuff, like I don't even wear hats. I have a championship hat. You know what I mean? Like same, same. I bought, I bought that ridiculous replica ring, which isn't even no, fucking that's, shiny. That's it's not even shiny. It's not even shiny. I put a filter on it when I took a photo of it. That's how much it doesn't glisten. I got this one, the, the Raptors championship hat, but the ring yeah. is kind of embarrassing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, I, I was like, man, winning a championship is expensive. Like the <laughs> amount of coin I was putting out, you know? So, yeah. I, I, so it's like, why not go for it? You know, that's how I feel. Yeah. So I completely agree with you and Draymond. Spending is great. Do it. You're billionaires. Yeah. This is ridiculous. Yeah, and, and we should want more guys like Balmer coming into the league, right? Yeah. Who are willing to spend a ton of money and build a new stadium out of his own money and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, teams like Balmer are, are kind of getting screwed in this one, which it's not like he can build a good team anyways. 
Like, <laughs> well, and you think about it too. Like, if if they didn't have an owner like Balmer, as much as I would have loved for Kawhi to stay at least one more year, because I think we would have repeated. But you need an owner like that to keep that team relevant and interesting. Because if they weren't, then the post Blake Griffin era could have been a disaster. I mean, you look at the San Antonio Spurs since they traded Kawhi Leonard. They their rebuild has been a disaster, right? Mm-hmm. Like like that trade will be five years this summer, hmm. and their rebuild has gone absolutely nowhere. And mm-hmm. so you know they've had to start again with you know they tried it with Demar, they couldn't get out of the first round at best. So then they move on from that, and then they had they had Dejounte Murray. Am I correct on that? And then yeah. they traded him. That wasn't working out. So it's like their rebuild is just in a no man's land right now yeah Yeah, where you look at teams like houston um you know where they're like hey like we tanked for a couple years but now like next year like we want to be in the mix and they're trying to be more serious after just a couple years removed from james harden you know and things like that so I, i don't know like you need owners like balmer just to like keep things interesting really yeah, I I don't share the same optimism about the Houston Rockets as you do. No, I'm not <laughs> saying they will be good, but I'm saying that just the fact that they want to be okay and like is, is important. And yeah, stuff like yeah. That. yeah, yeah, yeah. I I agree with that for sure. The yeah teams that tank for too long really piss me off. Mm-hmm. I mean, finally, OKC isn't tanking anymore. I thought they were going to tank again this year, especially after Chet Holmgren went down. I was like, oh, my God, this team is the worst. But thankfully, they are in the they're likely to be in the play in this year. Uh, I don't see them going beyond that, but it's going to be good experience for those guys to be in a high stakes game. And you need that because I, I mean, this is a bit of a tangent, but it's just like when you don't do that, then you become no disrespect, a Carl Anthony towns, right. In the Minis- with the Minnesota, who's been there for like eight years, I want to say, and, you know, has been in like a playing game. He's going to be in a playing game now. And it's just like, I don't know, like when you've been in a losing culture for too long, it's just hard to have it. Yeah, it's hard to change those habits that you build on a losing team, I think, is definitely the case. I actually wrote a big piece about tanking and veterans in the league and, and all that stuff that'll come out tomorrow. If oh, good. People are interested, but yeah. People I'm, are I'm very interested. anti-tanking. Uh, people are interested. Say it with more enthusiasm, please. Tell yeah, us where it's I'm anti-tanking, tanking and a part of it, too, is like teams like Houston's, uh, San Antonio okay see they've gone all in on youth and like there's literally no adults in the room to be like this is the right way to do things and like these are the habits you have to build and it's because they want to take as many cracks at at the apple as they can (laughs) so bites at the apple Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so they just fill their team with youth and uh and it has its pros but it also has like some real cons when you look at some of the off-court stuff that happens and the on-court habits right i mean that's what's happening with the grizzlies right now exactly that's yeah. how yeah that's where it really comes from um okay really loved that tangent very much uh let's move on to our raptors homer moment here and since my last episode um nick nurse has gone on a real nosedive here and we need to we need to break this down because you're his number one fan so i'm actually his how number are you gonna one. explain this i can't <laughs> i can't i am wow. his number one fan uh he doesn't know that um it's too bad uh people who listen to this podcast know i had the nick nurse hottie highlight of the week for a long time i changed it to a raptors hottie highlight of a week a couple months ago because i decided i couldn't keep manufacturing these <laughs> I couldn't keep doing it. I was like, it's too much. And like, you know, I I mean, I was saying this a few weeks ago, I'm pretty sure, but like, even just his whole demeanor this season hasn't been the same. Like he hasn't been doing the whole like crouching, you know, like the, like the, the, you know, the squats like by the sideline and things like that. He just hasn't been as animated in a way that I felt was very like fun and engaging or like really, you know, all of those things, all those fun mannerisms, the crazy facial expressions, like all of that has just been gone. And it's just been like 
anger and and uh, I don't know. I'm losing the words right now, but it just has frustration like his just his body language has just not been the same this year and obviously we haven't had the results and you know the minutes have been an issue the rotations have been an issue and last week during his post-game press conference i believe is against the 76ers he kind of like took a moment to like reflect on his time here uh unprompted which uh confused people and then uh two days later in charlotte when he was prompted he didn't want to talk about it anymore and uh a lot of you media folks got upset about that (laughs) which is understandable but it's such a media issue (laughs) Um, but yeah i mean you know so it's been a whole thing you wrote a really great article uh in yahoo sports recommend people to check it out about how uh discussing that before the season's over is really unfair to the players and really unfair to the team um which makes absolute sense to me there's no disagreement there on my part um what you being in the room you being well one of those games were on the road so maybe you weren't in the room per se but being in the inside what has this been like for you um that's a loaded question i mean (laughs) he's definitely frustrated and the season is definitely worn on him like just just in the way that he like you said acts on the sideline but also in the way that he talks to the media like he used to be very respectful no matter what the question and answer every question and yeah, just just treat us as just as good people. And and this season, like it's a human thing where it just seems like he's he's worn down and there's certain issues he won't talk. He won't be talking about like and, and there's certain t- comments or questions you can ask that will really frustrate him immediately. So that stuff is is um, I guess it's frustrating from a media standpoint, just because it is his job to like it's not a fun part of the job i understand that and he's a human and so a lot of this stuff can wear down on you but it is his job to like basically act as a conduit between the organization and the media right so that there's a lot of responsibility there and it's a huge part of any head coach's job and so you he has to like recognize that that's his job and the comments he made the other day were just like a failure to recognize that or a failure of foresight or a moment of weakness where he just went on a rant that he may be regretted after. But as the head coach, you can't invite unwanted noise into a locker room when it's literally your job to keep it out. So uh-huh. Uh-huh. those were my problem with the comments is just that like, why would you bring this up right now when, and I also brought this up, like when you ask so much of this team and these players this season, why like you you hold them to such high standards and and so much accountability you have to hold yourself to the same standards and i think it's pretty clear to say like this was an ill-timed thing and it was just an unprofessional way to address it um we can speculate why he said it there's all types of reasons like i don't know obviously and and any it's anyone's guess why he said them but to me it doesn't matter why he said it it's just the fact that he said it in the first place is pretty I guess it's just kind of amateur. Yeah, I think uh, it was, um, like you said, a moment of weakness. I think he just had a moment where he let his guard down and then immediately regretted it. And then that's Mm -hmm. why he didn't want to talk about it again when he was asked about it because he knew it was a mistake. And to Mm -hmm. uh, answer those questions and dwell on it would be probably to admit that mistake or to double down and go even further, which would be worse. So Mm -hmm. I think that's exactly what happened. And, you know, the writing's on the wall now. And I look before this season started, we were, you know, really high on Scotty Barnes, really looking forward to, you know, where in the playoffs we could potentially land, how we could grow this team. I created the Nick Nurse Happy and Angry at Refs calendar. Uh, shout out mm-hmm, to people mm-hmm. who bought it. I really appreciate sure. you. You know what I mean? But it came from a very different place as a fan. You know what I mean? And, you know, I'm 
as big of a fan as I have been of Nick Nurse, I'm certainly not blind. And I can see that like there's been a massive disconnect between him and the players, but also the front office. Like I have this feeling slash theory slash everything unconfirmed, another conspiracy hat that when this team, so I've personally never been a, a big fan of this whole six, nine vision. Personally, I'm just not a fan of it. And I think in this season when it wasn't you don't working, like tall guys. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm a tall woman and I love tall men. But aside oh, yeah. from that, aside from that, uh, no, it's not that I don't like them being <laughs> tall. It's just like as long as there are guys like Giannis, Embiid, Jokic in the league, you need guys that can match up against them defensively. And having an undersized center and committing to that to me doesn't make sense like mm-hmm. why would you put like i love the versatility part of it but why does everyone have to be the same height you know i mean look at how much better we are now that yaka Pertle's in the lineup right mm-hmm. it's like just having a bigger guy at center makes a huge difference and i feel like we were forcing guys like like pascal to play center can he play center yeah he can play center but is that what's best for him is that what's best for us? No, I don't think so. I just think we did that because we lacked options. Mm-hmm. And so there have been roster construction issues in addition to everything else. And I think conspiracy hat that Nick Nurse and the coaching staff were hoping that Messiah and Bobby would make bigger moves. And then when they didn't and they were like, actually, it's up to you now. It was like, oh shit, what are we going to do? Because I feel like when Nick nurse first started as a head coach here, you know, he was praised for being innovative. And I think over the years he became the opposite of that. He became stubborn Mm. and I don't know why that happened. And so I feel like that might have been because of a disconnect between him and the front office in addition between him and the players. Yeah. A lot. I know I just did a lot of you. No. And honestly, the, I don't know, like, no, how, it's a conspiracy hat. Nothing's proven. Yeah, it's it's definitely hard to say uh, where the issues are. But like, even the front office, whether or not there was a disconnect before this happened, there's no way the front office heard those comments and said, oh, this is a good thing. Like, think about it from a front office's perspective where they they know that a huge part of the coach's job and when you go through like a, a head coaching interview process in the NBA, a huge part of it is media because Masai and Bobby, these guys know that like it's, it's the head coach's job to ensure that all of this stuff, all of this outside noise is, is mediated or is tempered down a little bit. And that's the coach's job. So when Nick nurse goes out of his way to make these comments and, and basically invite speculation in, they're thinking about it like why would we feel comfortable going forward with this guy at the helm of our team acting as a spokesperson for our team when he's making these unwise comments yeah i feel like something happened i don't know what but i feel like something happened yeah yeah i don't want to speculate about that stuff it's definitely possible i'm the speculator yeah let let it be clear (laughs) it's definitely possible and if something happened and this was his way of kind of an F you to the organization, then that's possible. Um, it wouldn't be very professional of him. No, not at all. Yeah, definitely unprofessional. No question there. Um, it's just like, I guess like as a fan and I'm an outsider, so like I haven't really like met him or interacted with him in any way, but it's just disappointing because I really felt like we had like an, a Greg Popovich, Eric Spolstra type coach here that could be here for the long haul you know and like that's such a gift to have in this league when there's constant turnover with coaches like very rarely does a head coach last more than five years with the team and i thought we had that guy and then it's pretty clear that we don't you know and it's clear i mean he's made it clear uh at this point that he needs a fresh start somewhere I'm sure there will be many teams, not just the Houston Rockets, which have been rumored, uh, that will go after him this season because he is a championship coach and he does have Mm -hmm. a good reputation. And he did kind of like, um, 
I will say he influenced, not created, but influenced a bit of an era around versatility. And you see teams doing more, bo- well, not just box and ones, but you see that more too. And like other people trying to scheme in a more versatile, um, fast paced way. So he yeah. has had a lot of influence. And I think, you know, is he a good coach? Yeah, I do still think he is a good coach. Um, he's clearly not right for this team. Who knows what this team's even going to look like next season? Um, you know, there's that too. But yeah, it really does feel like it's the end of an era. And I feel like, you know, when we start talking about like what our plan is going to look like, it feels like there's less incentive now for this team to try and make some sort of a playoff push um, because everybody sort of knows like the writings on the wall, so to speak. That's how I feel. Yeah, I share that disappointment with you because until a couple of weeks ago, I also thought that Nick Nurse was going to be around for the long haul. I still think he's a really good X's and O's coach and, and all the stuff you said about especially defensive concepts that he introduced to the league is true. Um, but yeah, I, I think what you said about being stubborn, like you have to adjust in this league and especially now, like part of that piece I wrote too is that like young players, the league is getting younger and younger and young players have more and more power. And so you can't really be this like old head, strict Tom Thibodeau coach who doesn't adjust. And like credit to a guy like Tibbs, who it it appears at least that like over the years he has adjusted and how he treats the young guys and and all that stuff. And maybe the problem with Nick is that he failed to make those same adjustments um, because otherwise it's not like he's not a good enough coach to be around for a long haul. But is he? are the relationships with players in a good enough place for him to be around p- past five years? Cause that's, that's, what's really hard. It's like being around guys every day for five years, you're going to wear on each other unless you're a really special Greg Popovich level human where uh-huh. you know when to pick your spots and when to get at guys and when to be nice to guys. And also to do off court stuff. Like you always hear Greg Popovich doing just like, teaching guys about the world and and not only concerned about basketball, which I think Nick very much is. You never hear about the Raptors doing some of those, you know, off-court stuff, whatever it may be. That's true. So, yeah. Yeah, and what you said about the play-in is also true. Like, if I was a player at this point in the season, I would be like, just get it over with. You know, like, these comments don't help me want to compete. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't be incentivized to compete if if this was if I was on the Raptors right now and my coach made those comments and you kind of already know you're going to be uh, swept or near swept in the first round of the playoffs if you get there. So, um, you know, if you're going to go for it anyways and go down as a team, then you really need unity um mm-hmm. to go on that trek together and believe that there's something that you're building on for the future beyond this but you know i mean who knows if fred stays that's a big question it's gonna be looming over our off season and things like that but we definitely know nick is gonna be gone and yeah it's just you know it's an end of an era i think and just my personal fandom like i said earlier came from a different place you know like I remember the fun suits he used to wear and I feel like it kind of showcased his personality and I, I, you know, his guitar and like, I really enjoyed that he had a personality beyond uh, basketball and like he was really interested in music and, you know, even like his very corny acting stuff. Like I just thought it was cool because rarely do you see a coach have a personality that large beyond just basketball. And I always thought he was a very interesting person, but I feel like we've just lost that side of him really since the bubble. Like we just haven't seen that side to him as much. And it's just kind of, I don't know. It's just, it just hasn't been the same really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I, I personally could never be like an NBA head coach. That job is insane. Like legitimately insane. But you, you take, Like, I don't feel bad criticizing Nick either in, like, that story I wrote or here because it all comes with that. Like, it comes with the pressure, right? And it comes with people critiquing you and analyzing your every move. But it's an extremely – it's an almost impossible job just between the media, the player management, the work you have to do every day. 
it, it's insane. Yeah, Steve Kerr recently did um, uh, an interview with uh, Bobby Bob Bob Myers. Myers. That's his name. Yeah. yeah, with Bob Myers, and it was so funny because Bob Myers was like, "Thanks for sitting down with me," and Steve Kerr was just like, "Well, you're my boss, so you know, <laughs> I guess I have to do this interview." And it's about an hour long, and like one of the things Steve Kerr said, he was like remarking on their relationship, and he said like this relationship is pretty special because this relationship is inherently designed to fail the coaching and GM relationship. It's like, this only works as long as you win. And eventually all teams do start to lose. And the fact that they were losing, but were able to recover and win again together was, you know, special and unique and and different and how usually when a team starts to lose, the coach is gone and, yeah, you know, I realized like, yeah, like that is often how these things go. And it's most coaches only survive for so long anyway. So maybe this was more inevitable than we uh, initially realized at the start of the season. But um, mm-hmm. anyway, we, we started talking yeah. about it a bit, but let's talk about this Raptors team and, you know, the two regular season games we have left before this plan. Um, how, you know, we kind of touched on it a bit about how we feel like, you know, there might be a lack of motivation to keep going, uh, beyond the plan. Um, yeah. Is that more or less how you're feeling beyond the Nick nurse stuff? Yeah. Especially after last night's loss to the Celtics, I'm, I don't know. I I'm out. Like I, I don't believe in their ability yeah. to win two in play in games essentially and like win back to back playing games. And now it's, it's looking like in all likelihood, they're going to be the nine seed and they're going to have to win two playing games, even just to get into a first round series with the Bucks, who everyone believes is the best team in the league across the board pretty much. So it's not. Yeah. I, I'm kind of counting them out, to be honest. Um, I'm betting against them. Like, I, I think they'll probably win one playing game, and then they'll go on the road and face Miami or or Atlanta. And I just – the team hasn't shown me enough this season to where I can put my faith in them and say, yeah, they're going to win back-to-back high-pressure playing games, one on the road. I completely agree. I just think the the motivation just isn't there. I think this team would rather just call it, move on, and then see who we are next season. Um, yeah, I uh, I have also kind of been out on this team in the last week or so. Um, these two games against Charlotte, I was just like, if I didn't have this podcast, I wouldn't really be tuning in. Honestly, like that's Ooh, like. <laughs> Those are tough. You know, so shout out to uh, the other sickos listening to this podcast who are like in it for the long haul. Uh, We definitely appreciate you. But yeah, I think two more, two more games, two more games. Then this is done. Um, Mm. You know, it looks like we're going to be facing the Bulls in the play in for the first game. So Mm. I think that will be a fun competitive game. Who knows uh, who will take that one. But I wouldn't pick us to win against the Heat or the Hawks. Um, yeah, but I, like, tell me a better like cherry on top of this Raptors season than Demar hitting a game winner against us in the play. Listen, tournament. it just feels this, like that's where this is going. I thought that was gonna happen last year when the Bulls started doing well. I thought, oh no, we're gonna see each other in the playoffs or in the play-in, and Demar is gonna hit that game-winning shot and blah blah blah. I mean, yeah, that's very much what could happen. Um, I remember one time it was last Poor season. Kyle. Or Kyle. That would be even better. Yeah, or Kyle. I mean, I think like last year, like Damar had like a dunk on Chris Boucher and Chris Boucher looked like he lost his life, like his soul left his body after that dunk. Poor thing. Love Chris Boucher. But I'm just saying like, yeah, that that is looking like <laughs> heading. and then we're going to have a whole off season of speculation between uh, mid-April and July, essentially. So uh, I do think these comments clarified the off season. Like to me, it, it's looking like they're going to bring back the gang with a new coach. Which you really often, think so? Uh, yeah, I think the starting lineup will be brought back. Um, oh, okay. Not, not as confident about Gary Trent. I I would bet the starting lineup will be back. And like usually when a front office is like, let's just run it back, and a new coach will fi- fix things. I, I'm like very skeptical of that idea because just blaming it all on the coach is not usually a good idea. And I don't think this season has been Nick Nurse's fault by any means, but 
they know a lot more than we do. And if there's been some real like interpersonal dynamics between the coach and the players and, and a fresh start maybe is what they need. Um, I do think that clarifies things like his comments, just making it seem that way. And, and them not really doing anything at the deadline. Um, It feels like that's the direction it's going in. Yeah, I mean, and typically teams will replace a coach before they take apart their whole team. Yeah, I mean, that was another thing when all the tank rumors were happening before the trade deadline. I was like, typically you get rid of a coach before you do that. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I feel like, you know, if you're Fred, you're definitely going to explore what other options are out there. Right. Like if you want to be on a more winning team. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think he's definitely going to explore what other teams have to offer him. And I think it is going to come down to the money for him. I think he will sign with the team that pays him the most. Um, But also, why wouldn't he? I don't know. I think there's a lot of teams that are going to want him. There's a lot of teams that are going to want him. There's not going to be a lot of good teams with cap space to outright sign him. So he could force a sign and trade to a good team. But my thing with Fred, it really just comes down to I think he really likes Toronto. Aww. And money's going to matter. Like, they're going to have to pay him what any other team would. But I think he appreciates his situation a lot in Toronto. And well, he had a good yeah. interview with Taylor Rooks talking about that, too. I mean, he says it at every opportunity. So That's very yeah. true. And honestly, Oren, that takes me to my Raptors hottie highlight of the week, which is Fred and that interview it was honestly not a week of a lot of hottie highlights. Let's be real. It's a pretty low week for us, but Fred doing that interview was a bright spot. Uh, yeah, he does talk about how much he loves Toronto, which is great. I mean, he's from like Illinois, which is not warm. So maybe he doesn't care about how gray and cold it is here uh, all year round as much. Uh, also, Gary Trent Jr. always talks about how much he loves Toronto as well. And he was like repping Raptors though. merch and stuff. You know, yeah, but his he, dad he played about- here. He talks about, like, his love for Toronto, but he doesn't talk about... Like, Fred will be like, Bobby and Masai took a chance on me that I'll never forget, right? Right. And I feel like that's a bit different. He's played his whole career here. His relationships are really what I mean more than, like, the city itself. Okay, fine. (laughs) That's the read Um, I get. No, 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 I agree. Uh, Definitely check it out. It's uh, the interview Bleacher Report. Shout out Um, to Taylor Rooks. Yes, shout out to Taylor. It was a really great interview. Um, And yeah, so, you know, uh, next week we'll probably be looking at (laughs) what seems like the end of the Raptors season. uh, And we'll be able to reflect more in a greater existential way. But until then, Oren, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, for people listening, uh, where can we find you on the internets? Um, my Twitter handle is right here at Oren Weisfeld and the story that I referenced a couple times will be in the guardian tomorrow, Friday, April 7th about tanking and vets. And it was one that I worked on for a while and I think it's super interesting. So that'll be my last big feature of the season. And so, yeah, go read that. Uh, Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this week, and we'll catch you next time. Bye.